Welcome. Uh, uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm really thrilled to be here and thrilled to welcome you to Bard. Um, it's uh, it's it's a real honor and joy to have the Hannah Arendt Circle here, um, and uh, I've been enjoying myself today. I hope you guys have as well. And uh, we thought when. Um, Jen and Ann uh, contacted me and we talked about it. It turns out that the conference, the circle was shortly after the publication of this book, um, Artifacts of Thinking, uh, reading Hannah Arendt's Denk Tagebuch that Ian Story and I edited. And we thought um, it might be a nice uh, uh, thing to have some of the speakers, uh, some of the writers who have chapters in the book um, come and present a little bit. A, because there's so much interest in Hannah Arendt's Denk Tagebuch right now, as we just saw uh, in the last panel um, with those two great papers, and, uh, and also because a lot of us are here, uh, we're coming. Uh, five of the people who have contributions um, are here, so that's quite nice. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the history of it, just because it's interesting. About In 2012, um, we organized a week-long reading group. Uh, on Hannah Arendt's Denk Tagebuch. And it was somewhat modeled after a group many of you have been part of called the Collegium Phenomenologicum, um, in which we get together there. It's for three weeks, but we got together for a week and we read a book together. And what I did is I invited 10 people. Each person presented uh, uh, a, a half a day on a part of the Denk Tagebuch that they chose. And we read it together and talked about it. And afterwards, we decided that we would then take those um, uh, presentations uh, and develop essays out of them and provide a book which was not a definitive in any way account of how to read or of all the important things or interesting things in the Deng Tagebuch. We don't claim that at all, but it's an exercise in reading what is a very difficult book. Um, uh, sadly, it's still not in English uh, and I don't see that happening, unfortunately, all that soon. Um, and uh, <coughs> It's not only is it in German, and not only is it a thousand pages, uh, but it's in um, small bits uh, and sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, uh, and it's not something you just can sit down and read. Uh, and so we thought that this would be an, a way to offer uh, what in the end turned out to be uh, nine essays on how to read the Denk Tagebuch through certain different thematic uh, ideas, and I just want to let you know who was at the original conference because not everyone's here, and just to say it was there. So uh, I was there, Roger Berkowitz, Ursula Lutz, who's one of the editors of the uh, Denk Tagebuch. Sadly, Ingeborg Nordmann couldn't make it; she was having <coughs> surgery at the time. Um, but uh, Ursula was there, and 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 she was <coughs> a contributor. Uh, Thomas Wild, my colleague, um, Wout Cornelissen, there he is, uh, Anne O'Byrne. Uh, and then um, Tatiana uh, Naomi Tümmel uh, was not at the uh, working group, but uh, she contributed an essay, uh, a very wonderful essay on Hannah Arendt and love, and I know there's people working on that here. So, um, uh, in love in Arendt's Denk Tagebuch. Tracy Strong, uh, Jeff Champlin, and then Ian Story, who uh, I should say did the bulk of the work of producing this book, and I'm grateful to him as co-editor um, for, for that incredible uh, effort that he put into it. There are also two people who participated who, for reasons, uh, could not um, contribute essays. They just, and one is Patchen Markel, who I'm sure many of you know, and uh, the other is Christina Tarnopolsky. Um, you know, we talked a lot about what the, the Denk Tagebuch is, and um, one of the things I think we, t we all somewhat agreed, and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, you can shout it out now if you want, that it's not a finished product, right? It's clearly not. It's not a diary, and it's not a definitive guide. Um, but it's not just outtakes and ephemera, right? Uh, not a private fancy. And so part of the challenge of reading a book like this is to both take it seriously, which I think all of us believe we should and do, uh, and yet also um, remember that it's never going to be the final word. These are not things, except, you know, there's a couple of things that she publishes verbatim later, um, but that's not what this is. And so it really is a, 
a challenge to, to figure out how to read this book within the world of Honor, Hannah Arendt's published writings and even some of her finished but unpublished writings. Um, and that's part of what we're going to explore today. We're not going to all give long papers. There's too many of us, and uh, you would all fall asleep at this time of day. So we're going to each speak for 10 more or less minutes. We'll see how we do. Um, and try and give you a flavor of what we think is important in this Dank Tagebuch and why it's worth your reading it and engaging with it. And, uh, and then we can have a discussion about it. I hope it becomes more of a discussion than a QA, and a We'll see where that goes. I do want to note just um, in, before we move forward that we did decide to dedicate the book um, to two of Arendt's um, great students and uh, people who kept her legacy alive, uh, one who's sadly passed away, Elizabeth Young Brule, and the other is Jerome Cohn. So the book is dedicated to them. And uh, uh, I know they're both here with us in spirit. Okay. Anything to add, Ian, as co-editor? You want to? Let's get started. So um, one of the central questions to me of the Dank Tagawu is why bother? Why read it, right? What, is, is there something, you know, I, always, I get this question a lot from people, you know, is there something new in it? Is it going to change your view of RN? And I tried to say in the beginning, you have to be very careful about these kind of, of questions. Um, that said, I think there are things in it that um, help deeply uh, enrich our understanding of RN, not only in a scholarly historical way, but I think also in a way that um, at times can, at least for, I, I can only speak in my experience, help me understand RN in a significantly more profound way than I think I did before I could read, I, before I read the Dank Tagebuch. I think uh, having read it, things make sense that didn't always make sense before. Now, maybe other people won't find that. Maybe they didn't need it. They already understood it. Um, but for me, that was uh, a real experience of struggling with this dank tagabuch. And um, the part that I uh, uh, wrote about and was most impressed with, in the sense of being impressed, um, was part of the part that the last two papers um, by Thomas and Tal, right, uh, um, were, were talking about, which is this idea of reconciliation. Now, we heard a lot about forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, uh, I, I started there. I've published about four or five papers on this theme now over the last couple of years, and, and the first ones were about actually on uh, truth and reconciliation commissions and reconciliation and forgiveness and our end and revenge, which is the third uh, part that's sort of forgotten at times. Um, but I, I've, I've come over the last five years of writing on this topic to really believe that Forgiveness is not as uh, essential a concept in her work uh, as reconciliation, which leads to the obvious problem of why forgiveness is in the human condition much more so than reconciliation. And Tal mentioned um, the thesis that I defend in this, in this essay, that's the first essay of the volume, which is that in most regards, what she calls forgiveness in the human condition is what she has largely described as reconciliation in a lot of her other works. Um, and she explicitly says in the human condition, forgiveness, footnote, I don't mean forgiveness, right? When I use the word forgiveness, I'm translating the Greek aphine, which means to dismiss, um, which is uh, very much what she means by mutual release, which is the kind, which is how she describes reconciliation throughout much of her work. So um, we can argue about that. I'm sure, I'm sure many people disagree with it, uh, but it's a claim I, 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 I make in the essay. But in all honesty, um, I sort of moved past that and not as concerned with the forgiveness. Can you go to the next? That's the <coughs> book. Um, yeah, and here's uh, we, we, what, we, what I asked every one of us to do is pick one quote from the Denk Tagebuch um, to put up there so that we could actually read the Denk Tagebuch together in some sense. Um, these are all our own translations, so if they're wrong, you can yell at us. <laughs> Um, I'll read it in English, I guess, so that um, you can, we can follow along. So this to me is um, one of the really, it's, it's a quote that's really redefined my understanding of Arendt in many ways. Um, 
The solidarity of reconciliation is first not the foundation of reconciliation, as the solidarity of being guilty is the foundation of forgiveness, but the product, but the product. Reconciliation presupposes acting men and men who do wrong, but not men who are poisoned, taken over as a burden caused by another. Guilt, that is a psychological fact, does not come to be, but rather the actual happening wrong comes to be. One resolves oneself to be co-responsible, but under no circumstances co-guilty. Um, the, the, the key to this, and what drives my reading in this essay, is this idea of solidarity, the solidarity of reconciliation. And what needs to be understood, uh, or what I think needs to be understood, is that Arendt develops this idea of the solidarity of reconciliation against what she calls the idea, the, the, the idea of Christian solidarity. And Christian solidarity encompasses both forgiveness and revenge. Um, we have a Christian solidarity of forgiveness is based on the idea that um, we are all sinners, the original sin, and thus we all could have done this great evil, whatever it was, and therefore there's a solidarity of nature as sinners. And the solidarity, Christian solidarity of revenge is that um, if you can do a right to break the law and do evil, I have the right to break the law and do evil. We're all equal. And it's this fundamental um, Christian solidarity uh, that she says is apolitical because it, it does not allow for judgment. Um, there's no pathos of distance since we're all equal. And um, the reason reconciliation is so important in my understanding of RN, again, I'm not making the argument that you have to write about reconciliation to write about RN. I don't think that's the case at all. I just think it helps understand things, right? And if you look at the essay, what I do is I say there's nine theses about reconciliation that I find in her work, and I, the essay's broken up into nine parts, and I went go through all these theses, and I say some of them are mutually contradictory. Some of them, this is not a consistent theory, right? And I'm not making the argument it is. But reconciliation is uh, a kind of solidarity against Christian solidarity, and one that is, has the great virtue of that it allows for judgment, whereas Christian, Christian solidarity does not. Um, the, the basic idea of reconciliation is, as she says in that first sentence, the solidarity of reconciliation is not the foundation of reconciliation, but the product. And this is to me the line that makes a lot of sense to me, right? Um, reconciliation is the judgment um, that leads to solidarity. That means that politics, a polis, a common world, is based upon reconciliation. It's based on the, and, and so what is reconciliation is a judgment that leads to, pol to a common world, leads to a polis. It is the judgment that in the face of a wrong or evil that threatens to dissolve the common world. I mean, the obvious example, right, is um, the, not, the, the Holocaust or Eichmann or Heidegger. And the essay is sort of broken up into three judgments, right? There's the judgment of, Hol of Heidegger, the judgment of Eichmann, and the judgment of, of the Holocaust. And um, what I'm suggesting is that reconciliation is that when the world is threatened with dissolution by a great wrong, you are faced with a decision, a choice. You can either decide to love the world, Amor Mundi, with the evil in it, and say, I can affirm the world, I can reconcile myself to the world, and say, even though this evil is terrible, the world is better even with it in it than if it were not. Or you can decide to say, this evil is so awful that the world is not better with the evil in it, and I cannot reconcile myself to it. And the two judgments, or the three judgments, I think, that, she, that I talk about in different essays of her, uh, that I've written on this, are her judgment of Heidegger, her judgment of Eichmann, and the judgment of the Holocaust. It's not an accident that she writes this, 
there's there's like 30 sections on re, on reconciliation all through the Deng Tag Buk. They go from beginning to end. It's also interesting that the first and the last ones are about Heidegger. Um, uh, the f- Deng book opens on June 1950, three months after she gets back from visiting Heidegger and and working for the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Committee in Germany. And a week after she receives a letter from Heidegger with a copy of Hodelin's poem, Rife Suit, uh, which she has asked for. And if you reconstruct their letters, what you realize, and most of her letters to him have been burned, but when you can reconstruct what we have, you get a story, right? The story is that she goes, you all know the story, she visits Heidegger, they go for a walk in the Black Forest, and they talk about language, revenge, and reconciliation. And Heidegger says to her, I've been thinking about what you said about reconciliation. It's very rich. I'm not sure I agree with it. But you asked me to send you the poem by Holdelin on on reconciliation. Here it is, and it's this poem, Reifson. And the opening line that the the burden uh, on our shoulders, sits on our shoulders, is a indirect citation of the Holdelin poem, Reifson. So the whole thing begins with this conversation, which I argue, you know, I think, I mean, I speculate, and I think I'm, good grounds about the question of reconciliation slash forgiveness against Heidegger. And um, what she says is we can't worry about guilt in the person. This is what Thomas was talking about last in the last session. We have to think about we have to separate the wrong from the person and put it in the world. And I think Arendt's judgment is the world is better in it with Heidegger and all the things that he did that were wrong in it. On the other hand, um, someone like Eichmann, her judgment at the end of Eichmann in Jerusalem is clearly to what I take to be an example of what she calls non-reconciliation. I think it was Thomas, it might have been Tal, who, 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 who gave the line, which is to me the most important line in that section, uh, about the uh, unbarmherzliches uh, grenze der de Fassung, the, the merciless boundary of reconciliation. Um, and what she says is, there are things that you simply can't reconcile with. And when you encounter one of those, you must erase it from the world. You must say, this should not be. And the language at the end of Eichmann in Jerusalem, right? It would be better that you had not existed. Although she doesn't use the word reconciliation or non-reconciliation, is to me a clear judgment on her part of non-reconciliation. And so overarching, right, what I'm trying to suggest is that Reconciliation is for her the judgment we face. And the, one last thing I want to say, uh, I'm going to t- t- tie it together, because I've only done now the first and the last section. There's seven in between. But a lot of them are about Hegel and Heidegger. And Hegel is the touchstone for reconciliation. So any of you who've read a lot of Hegel know that uh, Versunung is a key word in Hegelian corpus. And the key... And Arendt, whenever Arendt writes about reconciliation in every one of her published texts, except um, uh, on revolution, um, and we could argue about uh, origins, which is before this, but all the others, it's there, and in many of her essays. And in um, Between Past and Future, in the preface, she writes that the trouble, uh, that, that for Hegel, the task of the mind is to reconcile with reality and to be at peace with the world. And Arendt calls this risable, right? awful, because we shouldn't reconcile with the world. We live in a world that there's evil in. And she opposes the Hegelian reconciliation project. But then she says this, which she repeats in countless places in her work. The trouble is that if the mind is unable to bring peace and to induce reconciliation, if reconciliation doesn't work, it finds itself immediately engaged in a kind of warfare. And this is how we understand the gap between past and future the battlefield, as she calls it, the Schlagfeld. Um, what for Arendt, in the end, the goal of her thought, what she calls thinking without banisters, is to reconcile ourselves to the irreconcilability of the world and to love a world in which we need to, uh, at all times, um, be engaged in the battle to understand and make judgments in a world in which there is no possibility of uh, the rationalization of the is in the Hegelian sense. And so 
Uh, this is a very short attempt to give a flavor of what's in the essay. Um, but I think reconciliation, which is in all of her work, many of her, most of her works, but is never a major theme, is, I think, one of the two major themes of the Deng Tagebuch. And it's, in a sense, the, the hidden, the back story to a lot of her thinking on judgment, on politics, um, and, um, and the attempt to, uh, to live in a world after the break of tradition. So I will leave it at that. And uh, Thomas Gill. Thank you, Roger. Can we applaud? No. <laughs> Um, I first of all would like to thank uh, Roger and in absentia also Patchen for organizing this amazing uh, week uh, that we had for two reasons. One, first of all, it's such a rare occasion that uh, you can be together with 10 people uh, who you, you respect and admire and read one book together. Uh, it's, uh, it's been an amazing experience and, and several things have come out of it. Working relationships and, and, and collaborative projects. And this book is, uh, is one of the wonderful uh, um, things that came out of it. And uh, I'm also grateful that because of that, I think, uh, conference you organized and because of the book that you and uh, Ian put together, now actually the Denk Tagebuch, which has really changed, I think, our own scholarship uh, uh, over the past 15 years, um, now, for the first time, can enter the English-speaking world in a more, uh, let's say, systematic way. And uh, I think we can all expect um, um, uh, wonderful responses and impulses uh, from that. So I'm really grateful for that and would like to point this out. Um, what we did in that, uh, during that week, uh, one could call maybe something, something like exercises in reading the Denktagebuch. And, uh, and the uh, that the, the, um, the assignment, so to speak, was that everybody takes a passage of the book of about 10 pages and, and re reads that passage and unfolds in reading out of that passage. And <clears throat> the passage I chose is, uh, comes m right after the passage uh, uh, that Roger was talking about. And it contains a question that for me is uh, a, a, um, a core point and a starting point of Arendt's project as a whole. And this question is uh, um, written down in November 1950. So at the very beginning, half a year after the Deng Tagebuch, uh, after, yeah, after the Deng Tagebuch was started. And it's, an, it's a remarkable moment also because the manuscript of Origins of Totalitarianism has been concluded, was on the way to publication. And at this point, Arendt begins the Deng Tagebuch after her first, and you know, massive, eminent book written in English, uh, she starts the Denk Tagebuch in, uh, in mostly in German, but in a multiplicity and the plurality of languages. And the question I was intrigued by, and I keep being intrigued by, is the one that you uh, see uh, at, the, at the screen. Die Frage ist, gibt es ein Denken, das nicht tyrannisch ist? So the question is, is there a way of thinking which is not tyrannical? And for me, so this is a thought in the form of a question which begins and forms, in my view, the center of Arendt's work for the, for the years to come as she rethinks the political, rereads dominant and hidden traditions of philosophy and political thinking and develops an unprecedented mode or unprecedented modes of writing in the face of an unprecedented break in history and tradition. And so I was, I took the, uh, th that, uh, panel or that week as an occasion to see what's actually, what's the context, what's the surroundings of this question, and to close read that. And uh, again, it's impossible to, <laughs> to address the complexity of it in 10 minutes, but I, what I found is, to put it in, in sort of schematic terms, is first of all, what you would expect, conceptual uh, reflections on, on truth, on reality, on, um, on philosophy and politics and freedom and tyranny. So there's a cluster of, of reflections around those terms. What I also found, and that began to intrigue me uh, equally uh, uh, um, strongly, is that there is a, a, a dense occurrence and appearance of poetry and poems, 
around that question. And I would say a, a, a particular uh, condensation or, or uh, um, yeah, density of what I would call a plurality of languages. So several languages aren't rights in, and several modes, I think, aren't uh, rights in. And f through that, uh, jumping to the end, so to speak, and uh, for, for the arc I would like to make, I began to see almost a, uh, an exemplary crystal of Arendt's uh, modes of writing or poetics, I would see, political poetics, or poetics of, of, of political thinking. So the entry itself, where this question appears in the Denktagebuch, is about the affin affinity of the philosopher and the tyrant since Plato. And uh, we all can discuss and debate that reading of Plato, but the point that Arendt is making in this entry uh, is that the tradition of Western thought that identifies thinking and reason with logic begins somewhere there, and the irrevocable laws of logic, according to Arendt, are by definition connected not to freedom, but rather to tyranny. And if one understands this tradition where the political is the concern of man and of a rational constitution, then only tyranny can produce good politics. The political, however, she, uh, she says, is not intrinsic to humans. It is not part of the human essence. The human being is apolitical, Arendt states, in a neighboring entry, and she conceptualizes it and explains it in the human condition, the birthplace of freedom and of the political lies in between people, zwischen den Menschen. And that, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a related entry just next to it, there's a, another quote that for me is sort of a core quote related to that. I should have put it up there as well. I read it twice uh, because it's so, um, it's so essential in my view. And this entry reads, I read it first in English and then in, uh, uh, in German. Uh, Politics arises in the space between people and establishes itself as the relationship. And the, the entry is, is, is uh, originally in German. Politik entsteht im Zwischen und etabliert sich als der Bezug. So politics establishes itself in the in between of people and politics establishes itself in the mode of, re of relationality, as this relation, right? And that's uh, sort of my, uh, uh, I, I take this impulse to think more about Arendt as a potential relational thinker. And I have a, a longer spiel in here on the way Arendt writes with conjunctions, and in particular the conjunction and uh, and I would, uh, I'm, I'm making a point uh, to say that Arendt, in my view, is an and thinker and not a because thinker. Um, and I, I could, could talk about that more later uh, if you were interested. So an and where actually only the particulars of the both sides define the meaning of the end. It can actually bring together contradictory elements. Uh, and uh, so this and is sort of a... a, a an occasion to think about the in-between and the, the way in which Arendt uh, unfolds the in-between as a task of thinking the political. So this thought of distinctions such as conjunctions that are binding without being tyrannical is related to Arendt's reflection on plurality. The beginning of these thoughts are noted in her earlier entries as well in the Denktagebuch, and we know from her later writing as the human condition and on violence that plurality, the existence of the many and the various, for her was a prerequisite of, of politics, and politics whose raison d'etre is freedom arises from the spontaneous speaking and acting together of the many and various. Everybody here in the room is a, a familiar with that. At the beginning of the Denktagebuch, she makes a connection between her reflection of plurality, on plurality as a political <coughs> concept and a plurality of languages, Pluralität der Sprachen, and in fact renews and contextualizes her original question of non-tyrannical thought that way. If there were only one language, perhaps we would be sure of the nature of things, Arendt writes. And she thinks the idea of a world language is not only nonsense, unsinn, but also an 
And that's another important quote in my view. She says, the idea of one language of truth, of one language that unites everything and grasps everything is an artificially enforced disambiguation of the ambiguous. Eine künstlich gewaltsame Vereindeutigung des Vieldeutigen. A totalizing ab uh, 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 abolition of plurality. Now, what she, uh, I think, does with this notion of a plurality of languages being related to her own question, is there a mode of thinking which is not tyrannical, one could say goes in two ways. She, she takes this in two directions. One is the decision to write in two languages as a daily practice, something that we are some of us are aware of, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard to be aware of. The uh, 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 critical edition that we are preparing and that uh, Roger is part of and Wout is part of and Thomas Barcher was here uh, before is part of, is trying to show, uh, for the first time, make that readable. This practice of writing in two languages, writing in more than one language, as I would add, as a response to the experience and the inheritance of totalitarianism, to, re to respond to that in a plurality of language which is as a daily practice. The second way I think sh one could read this plurality of languages is a plurality of modes in which Arendt writes. The negative, let's say, the, 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 the critical uh, view of that is always, oh, there's all, there are all these inconsistencies, right? As Roger has said, if we look at reconciliation, we find an enormous and inspiring range of thoughts which don't form a consistent, cohesive, total one, but uh, does something else. And we all know she writes different on, or on, on totalitarianism than she writes on the human condition, and she writes different on Eichmann than she writes on the crisis of the Republic. And uh, here, uh, I, uh, I would say these different modes of writing are a, 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 a conscious and deliberate way of unfolding or responding to this question, is there a mode of thinking, is there a way of thinking which is not uh, tyrannical, is there a way of writing that is not uh, tyrannical. <coughs> One specific element within that modes of writing is that uh, the, she writes, uh, that uh, got me inspired by that passage I looked at, is the way she writes with poetry. So with, or the way she breaks up a discursive argument by bringing on other voices. One could also say a specific, uh, a specific poetics or ethics of quoting, of inviting other, uh, uh, other voices into the text. And the way she does that with poetry in particular is that she would often, as we all know, also in her English texts, uh, reflecting, for example, on concepts of time, <coughs> All of a sudden, there's a full stop at the end of the paragraph. Then there's a poem by, by Rilke in German in the English in, in, in between past and future, non -transla not translated. And then the English text continues. So that kind of shift of 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 of, of investigation and of tone and of language actually as a reminder and as a, I think a written response to uh, or uh, to that task to the self-defined uh, 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 task of um, um, non-tyrannical uh, thinking. Let me conclude with the observation that it was a poet who <coughs> responded, in my view, uh, particularly uh, captivating uh, to Arendt's persona as a writer and a thinker. And this poet is a German poet called Hilde Domin, who is an exile. Uh, a, um, uh, she, was, she left Germany because she was Jewish. She left Germany in 32 already. And they got to know each other and exchanged uh, Hilde Domin sent her uh, sent Arendt poems and they had a little um, correspondence. And Domin gave in a, in a, in a, um, in a novel a line that he, uh, addressed to a voice that she says that's Arendt's voice. And um, uh, I read it in in German first, and then the English translation, and then I'll, uh, uh, I'll conclude. And this is, so to speak, a, a poetic response and portrait of Arendt by, by a poet responding to her writing. Auf dem Atlantik, sagte eine, baue ich mein Haus. 
Beide Kontinente sind unmöglich, ich lebe zwischen ihnen. I'll build my house on the Atlantic, she said. Both continents are impossible, I live between them. It is, a, to me, a moving and apt image of, of Arendt's place between languages, between audiences, between traditions, and it is the emerging outline to me of a thinker of conjunctions and of relations. And I'll continue in a different, uh, I, I, I keep continuing in, in, in the article, but I want to conclude here for now. Thank you. Yes, um, I would like to start by uh, thanking Roger for inviting me to be on this panel today and to, uh, I would like to thank Ian and Roger together for editing uh, the way in which you edited this uh, wonderful uh, volume. I'm really happy uh, to be part of this. Um, the quote I picked um, today is actually not from my chapter. I just thought, my, well, why? Mm -hmm. I want to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. Chapter is done. Um, but there is a relation between the, the, the quote and the chapter. Um, and I'll, I will get to that. Um, <clears throat> because I, I chose this quote in order to illustrate a certain approach to Arendt's work, um, um, which consists in tracing certain thought fragments. That's a word she uses in her essay on Benjamin. A thought fragment, uh, so a term, an expression, a quotation, often in another language, another language than English, um, or translated from another language, um, a thought fragment that runs like a motif through her writings. And in my um, essay, in the volume, um, I used these thought fragments in order to reconstruct an answer or the answers Arendt uh, gives to the question that Thomas Wild um, also addressed in his essay and today, um, uh, Arendt's question, is there a way of thinking uh, that is not tyrannical? Um, so the quote I picked starts, itself starts with a quote. It contains a quote. Um, and that particular quote that is from Luther uh, stuck with me, Martin Luther, stuck with me since the very first time I read it. I did not read it for the first time uh, in the Denktagebuch because um, I read the Denktagebuch much later uh, thanks to the invitation I got from Patrick Markel and Roger to participate in the one week workshop in June 2012 at Bard College uh, that lies at the basis of this volume and that lies, that determined to a great extent, um, in fact, where I am, where I am today. Um, so the first time I read that quote um, was in chapter 13 of The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, titled uh, Ideology and Terror, a Novel Form of Government, which was published as an article in 1953. And there's more to be told about that essay, but I won't do that now. Um, so if you uh, recognize the quotation, it is probably from that chapter. And I'll, I will read a brief passage from that chapter that thought processes characterized by strict self-evident logicality from which apparently there is no escape have some connection with loneliness was once noticed by Luther. In a little known remark on the Bible text, it is not good that man should be alone. In a little known Bible text, um, uh, in, sorry, in a little known remark on the Bible text, it is not good that man should be alone. A lonely man, says Luther, always deduces one thing from the other and thinks everything to the worst. Ein solcher, das heißt einsamer Mensch, folgert immer eins aus dem anderen und denkt alles zum Ärgsten. What is interesting about this passage, I think, is precisely the connection Arendt draws between the tendency to think everything to the worst and the experience of loneliness. That is the experience of being abandoned by yourself. For Arendt finds the counterpart of, um, of loneliness in solitude. She distinguishes loneliness from solitude. Solitude is 
Um, I mean, in both cases, you're by yourself, but in, in the case of solitude, there's still a soundless dialogue going on between you and yourself. The two-in-one, a plurality, in fact, is still intact. But in the case of loneliness, you're abandoned by yourself. And in our current time of regime change, it seems as if the tendency to think everything to the worst proliferates. Um, Arendt treats this phenomenon of deducing one thing from another and thinking everything to the worst as a core characteristic of ideological thinking, as she explains in that chapter and in that article. Um, but I, I think, and she might agree, I don't know, um, that this phenomenon is actually very common, uh, even banal. Um, you are on your way to catch a flight, and the shuttle to the airport you are, you are on is running late and is caught in traffic. A must lead to B, and down to the rest of the alphabet. Of course, you will miss your flight. There is no one there to assure you of the role of contingency in human life and human affairs until you arrive at the airport. And it turns out that your flight is delayed as well. So you're able to catch it perfectly in time. Let me now turn to the quote from the Denktagebuch. Because um, the, the essay from 1953, that's not the first um, time that she uses the quotation. The first time she writes it down is in her Denktagebuch in August 1951. Um, and I'll it's, it's projected on the screen, I'll, I'll read it. And it's written in German, but I'll read the English translation. It's my translation. Um, at logic and loneliness. In short, such a human being, that is a lonely human being, always deduces one thing from the other and thinks everything to the worst. Logic is the sin of loneliness, hence the tyranny of what can be compellingly proven. Conquest by the lonely. Quotation from Luther, Why Fleeing Loneliness, 1534. Erbauliche Schriften, so uh, edifying writings. Um, in every togetherness, the deficiency of logic comes to light in the form of a plurality of opinions, which cannot be compellingly combined. Always deduce one thing from the other means abandoning human beings and the world, means elevating one arbitrary opinion to a premise. She uses the word tyranny here, the tyranny of what can be compellingly proven. Um, and also the tyranny of abandoning human beings and the world and elevating one arbitrary opinion to a premise. But the, the counterpart to that, um, she also mentions, what would it mean um, to be, um, not to be abandoned? Human togetherness. In human togetherness, the deficiency of logic comes to light in the form of of a plurality of opinions which cannot be compelling, compellingly combined. There you see the contrast between the tyranny of, um, of what can be, co of logic, of logical reasoning, and the freedom, in a way, of being uh, together and um, having a plurality of opinions rather than elevating one opinion to uh, a premise from which everything else uh, will then follow. Um, so, it is clear that in, in this case, um, as she already explains in, in, in chapter, or, or it, as she will explain two years later in, the, in chapter 13, that um, the solitude of the, of the dialogue between me and myself forms a kind of <coughs> remedy to that um, lonely logical uh, reasoning. And in my, in my chapter in the, in the book, I, I show um, how other manifestations of thinking, so besides the soundless dialogue of, between me and myself, um, uh, namely representative thinking, which is thinking in the place of someone else, um, and uh, poetic thinking, making sure that the concepts we use correspond to the right <coughs> form of experience, provide answers to that question um, 
that question, uh, are there forms of thinking which are not tyrannical? Um, so I always thought that this quote was rather isolated in her writings, that it, it would not occur again after the early 50s. But recently, only recently, I um, discovered that this is not true. This is not the case. The Luther um, quotation occurs once more, and maybe even <coughs> more often, but I, I don't know that, um, about 20 years later. In three different versions of a draft um, of what would eventually become uh, chapter two of the book manuscript of the life of the mind. In this paragraph, Arendt compares thinking to the other two of the mental activities, so to willing and judging. As you know, the life of the mind was supposed to be about these three mental activities. Um, and I'll read this um, paragraph to you. Hence, seen from the world of appearances, thinking is the most radical of the mental activities. The thinking ego, left entirely to itself, divorced from the purposes of judgment and from the will's projects, subject only to the faculty of reason, transcends necessarily the limitations of common sense. And thereby, and she quotes Kant there, the subjectively necessary touchstone for the rightness of our statements, <coughs> and therefore also for the sanity of our mind, which consists in comparing it with the mind of others. This loss causes the thinking ego's inclination towards recklessness and extremism, says Arendt. For its own devices, so the devices of the thinking ego, are nothing but the devices of self-consistency. Thinking <coughs> obeys only one law, the axiom of non-contradiction. And it is precisely this obedience that leads so easily to what Kant called logical obstinacy. Logischer Eigensinn, according to him, a kind of insanity. Or to that weird loneliness, which is not even felt as such anymore, and in which, as Luther once remarked, a man always deduces one thing from the other and thinks all matters to the worst. Ein solcher, einsamer Mensch folgert immer eins aus dem anderen und denkt alles zum Ärgsten. Quote. The fact that this quote was still on her mind 20 years after she wrote it down for the first time in the Denktagerbuch in 1951, because this was in 1972, shows the intimate bond between her later and her earlier thought. And this is something you can see not just in the case of this quote, mm. um, but in the case of many different motifs mm. that run through her writings. For example, as you know, in the life of the mind, there are two chapters on metaphor. But already in the early 50s, there are entries on metaphor which express um, the thought that she would write down and, and, and intend to publish 20 years later. Still, in the final manuscript, manuscript as she left it behind, this passage was left out. So it's, we can only find it in the draft. So it is left out in a version that served as the basis for Mary McCarthy's published version of the book, of the, of the Life of the Mind. I can only speculate why this is the case. Um, in many ways, the Life of the Mind can be read as Arendt's song of praise for the mental activities. And it tries to show the activity of thinking in its being fully active, in its being fully alive. Maybe that is the reason why any explicit treatment of what a lack of thought of, a of, or a loss of thought or thoughtlessness would consist in seems to be in the background in that book. At the same time, it is only in the light of the life of the mind and the different aspects of thinking in its being fully active, uh, which it, this book addresses. So the soundless dialogue between me and myself, thinking in the place of someone else, and most importantly, poetic thinking or metaphorical thinking, all three of which establish some form of correspondence between ourselves and the world, maybe reconciliation even. It is only in the light 
of the way in which life, in the life of the mind, she reconstructs uh, the thinking activity in its being active and alive, that the compelling force of logic to which the lonely man or woman clings can appear as a deprived form of thinking. The life of the mind in all its version, and actually in Arendt's version, will become readable in about 2019 when Bart Connellison and Thomas Bartscher will have edited right. and reconstructed Hannah Arendt's life of the mind uh, <laughs> uh, from Mary McCarthy's life, life of the mind for the critical edition. Thank you, Walter. It was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, is that my phone? Yeah, it's all right. Oh. I'll stop in a second. My apologies. It's okay. um, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks for having the Hannah Arendt Circle here. And thanks for that, that weekend, that, that slightly strange but definitely wonderful week uh, that we had here uh, several summers ago. Uh, just being uh, in the Hudson River Valley in the depths of summer <laughs> and uh, sitting on the porch of the Hannah Arendt Center uh, drinking whiskey in the evenings and, uh, and talking about Kant. I learned a great deal. It was, uh, it was quite an exceptional experience. The uh, quote that I have here has uh, nothing to do with the article uh, that I submitted later for your volume, uh, but it does have to do with a course that I'm teaching at Stony Brook this semester on census communis. So I was delighted uh, to be sent back to the Denk Tagebuch again uh, for this occasion and to discover there some wonderful gems, as you always do, uh, to discover these wonderful gems that related specifically to uh, what I was working on. Under the heading, Maxims of the Healthy Human Understanding, Kant placed, think for oneself, think consistently, and also common sense, that is, think from the point of view of everyone else. In this way, he brought together the principle of autonomy, agreement with oneself, and agreement with others, and that is the greatest advance in political philosophy since Socrates. That caught my eye. <laughs> when law-giving reason operates only on the basis of its autonomous, non-contradictory self, it leaves out others. That is its failing. So why <coughs> delve into the Denk Tagebuch at all if not to discover something new, if not to come upon something that we hadn't thought about before? A new thought, perhaps? a new angle, a new connection, a different genealogy, a new thought train, or a familiar thought train that's now assembled in a different order. Maybe there's a hint at a philosophical engagement with somebody unexpected, or in an unexpected way. Uh, perhaps we find there some measure of confusion, as Thomas and Tao did uh, when they went in search of uh, evidence or thinking about forgiveness. A confusion that has the, serves the function of setting thought in motion again. And that's my experience every time of looking at the Denk Tagebuch, that in anticipation of something that will reassure me that I have maybe understood something, I end up being upset and shown that there really is a lot more to understand. Uh, inevitably, it keeps thought in motion. So what we see here is quite familiar if we uh, have given even a cursory glance at the lectures on Kant's political philosophy, which Arendt uh, delivered, mind you, in the early 1970s. But this note comes from 1957. And so it's not uninteresting, uh, as you just mentioned. Uh, it's not uninteresting to see her thinking about these same subjects <coughs> already 15 years earlier. Now, there are two reasons why I've uh, two things that I had anticipated saying here about this particular quote. One had to do with judgment, the other had to do with Socrates. But since I arrived only last night, there has been so much that has happened, so many conversations, so much thinking going on, uh, that uh, once again, the thoughts have been, the thought trains have been set off you know, along different tracks. And I find myself thinking rather uh, in terms of those very conversations that we've had in the last 24 hours. So, in the light of Schmuel's paper today, for instance, it's distinctly, distinctly interesting to know that Heinrich Blücher was lecturing on Socrates and Plato in 1954, 
so just a couple of years before this. And whatever Leon told us yesterday about Blucher having absolutely no influence on our own <laughs> thinking, <laughs> I think Schmoll's paper showed us, uh, showed us that there was something to, uh, uh, to work with there. I'll come back to that in a moment. But of course, what we have referred to here is the, uh, that moment in the Critique of Judgment, uh, section 40, where we see uh, Arendt, uh, or where we see Kant assembling these three maxims, uh, maxims of healthy human understanding. And of course, uh, this is a famously weird place for anybody to go for Kant's political philosophy. I mean, he wrote those essays that were explicitly political essays, but Arendt uh, famously decides not to go there and instead finds his political philosophy right there in the Critique of Judgment. And out of uh, Section 40 comes after a long um, dismantling of the experience of uh, the judgment of the beautiful and the strange position that it occupies uh, that doesn't, couldn't ever have found a place in the first critique, certainly couldn't have found a place in the second critique, and now required the writing of this uh, third critique, the critique of judgment, or the critique of the faculty of judgment. And here is where, Car uh, where Kant um, <coughs> uncovers the role of imagination and the, uh, the very deep role that imagination plays in his entire political project. And this thought train then got interrupted in the course of uh, Anandita's talk and Matt's Matt's response to it earlier on. Because, of course, the argument that has emerged out of uh, Kant's, uh, Arendt's lectures on Kant's political philosophy is, insofar as we understand them as a reading of Kant, uh, then we have this problem that Kant presents them pretty straightforwardly as transcendental principles, whereas uh, Arendt herself is very concerned to, to give them some more robust empirical uh, content. But the question partly is whether we should read her lectures on Kant's political philosophy as being on Kant at all, mm -hmm. really, or whether it is rather an occasion for her to think about political philosophy, particularly <coughs> in terms of that between that you've both mm -hmm. drawn our attention to here. But interestingly, just before this particular uh, note, in 1957, uh, we, see, uh, we see this entry. The reason why Kant can't carry through the step from the a priori to the a posteriori could be that his discovery of the faculty of judgment exploded the entire, the the entire schema of a priori and a posteriori. What on earth could that look like? I mean, what would happen uh, to critical philosophy if the difference, the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori were exploded? I think that's what philosophy is still trying to figure out. And I think Arendt was, uh, was way ahead of us in identifying this as something that we needed to think about. She goes on, the general validity of judgment is not a priori. It's not something <coughs> settled in and by itself, but it depends on common sense, on the presence of others. And that's what gave us the political philosophy that she derived from or found in, or in some way that involves and rather than because, uh, that, she, uh, that emerged for her from Kant's third critique. That same structure, I think, is at work uh, could be seen in the discussion that we had around Fanny's paper earlier today, because we were worrying about whether birth was for Arendt something entirely abstract, or was it something that happened involving people's bodies? Is it embodied birth, or is it abstract birth? And I think maybe what has to happen, like the, a, the schema of the a priori and a posteriori, it has to be broken apart. Maybe the distinction between abstract and embodied is something that has to be allowed to fall apart, that has to be allowed to explode and set our thinking underway again. But meanwhile, this, this quote on the board uh, mentions that uh, the addition of that third principle in Kant's section 40 of the Critique of Judgment was the biggest thing to happen since Socrates. 
Hmm, the biggest thing to happen in political philosophy since Socrates. It's, uh, it's a matter of numbers, of course. It's got to do with the two in one. Uh, what is it that Socrates gave us uh, that would make sense in this context? Uh, it's the, the notion that thinking is a dialogue, uh, an internal dialogue, and so already what we regard as the individual is a matter of a conversation. Uh, two in, uh, two people in the one. But it's a matter then of this happening, this being the character of thinking, or this what makes possible thinking, uh, that even as we think for ourselves, uh, we are required to think in accordance with ourselves. So Plato takes up the dialogue form, uh, and philosophy remains for him a matter of dialogue. But uh, he, in Arendt's thinking at least, is the one who remains committed to thinking as in the mode of contemplation. So we continue to turn away from the world. So it's not the greatest thing that's happened in political philosophy since Plato, mm -hmm. but rather since Socrates. Because for Socrates, uh, it's not a matter of contemplation. Uh, it's not, as well as being a matter of thinking, it is a matter of living with oneself. And the sense that uh, doing wrong was intolerable for Socrates because it meant that he would have to live forever with a wrongdoer. And so we find, uh, we find ourselves thinking of, uh, of the apology. And I suppose we should remember that we have the apology not just from Plato, but also from Xenophon. So we have, uh, we have a triangulated Socrates to work with there. And uh, at a certain point, he talks about what happened when he was called upon to do wrong, uh, when the authorities told him and a couple of other fellow citizens to go and arrest somebody. And Socrates' response was <coughs> to go home. Mm -hmm. And this was, uh, this was the moment at which uh, it was utterly clear to him that to do wrong in that particular case would have left him in the condition of living the rest of his days with, uh, with a wrongdoer, in, uh, in intimate company with a wrongdoer. What Kant adds then is, uh, is others. So it is uh, a plural that goes beyond two. And it is the principle of plurality, according to Arendt, uh, a principle of plurality that extends beyond just the positions, the imagined possible positions of others, but indeed the perspectives of actual others. And we had the beginnings of a conversation earlier today about that. What happens when we see Arendt performing that and getting it painfully wrong in the process? I think that, that failure is, uh, is immensely instructive, the example of the Little Rock piece, uh, the attempt that she makes to put herself in the position of others, and it, her occupation of that position being itself uh, so distinctive and, and so very uh, expressive of her own subject position. But we're still left with the question of what canon is it that she has in mind when she talks about this moment, uh, this Kantian contribution being the, the, the most important advance in political ph philosophy since Socrates. And at this moment, I found myself thinking of Arendt's insistence that she wasn't a philosopher, uh, she did uh, periodically. <coughs> But it also reminded me of my own days as an undergraduate when m half my degree was in philosophy and half was in politics. So I was doing a lot of political theory uh, classes and political philosophy classes. And you wonder, well, what on earth can be the difference between those two things? But curiously, they have different canons. Uh, in a philosophy department, you don't read Machiavelli, for instance. Uh, you don't read Montesquieu. Yeah, there's, a, there's a whole political theory canon uh, that you're expected to work through uh, in a political theory program, whereas in philosophy, for reasons that I, I can't, <coughs> well, I, I have some ideas about it, in the sense that you, you spend a great deal of time with Hobbes and Locke, which you probably do in political theory too, but Hobbes and Locke are presented as philosophers because they have all that nominalism in the case of Hobbes, uh, they have all that metaphysics and epistemology in the case of Locke. Oh, and by the way, here's some political theory, uh, political philosophy that we can stick on the end of them. So that, <coughs> that lodges them deep in the canon. But what we see uh, in, one, uh, in one dramatic claim here, you know, the biggest thing since Socrates, uh, is 
uh, a rebuilding of the canon. And this reminds me, this came up in conversation, one of the first conversations I had when I came here last night uh, with Seamus, who's around here somewhere. Uh, the, uh, the work that, uh, that Rorty and Skinner and Schneevin did in the 19, uh, 1980s, 1990s, about the whole question of canon building. And I think in our end, and we see this uh, emerging day after day in the Dengtalga book, she's building her own canon all the time. Uh, it emerges in the published work. I'm sure it emerged in her teaching all the time. But here, you know, from one small note to the next, we see the canon expanding and the, um, and the work of thinking extending through an ever broader set of works, historical and contemporary. And we see that happening here today as well. We see Tao going to Derrida, so adding Derrida and uh, as one who also himself is consistently, ex or who throughout his thinking expanded the canon too. We see Karen working through Hegel. We see Anandita uh, adding Rousseau into the mix. And what we end up with is a, uh, a way of thinking demonstrated by Arendt uh, that teaches us how to be nimble as thinkers. <coughs> uh, it teaches us how to be ready to respond to the demands of the moment, to responsibility in war, as Phil talked about it earlier, to new populisms, as Angie talked about it, to all of the questions that are going to be brought up in the next hour here, to all of the questions uh, that we will consider in the course of our meeting tomorrow, tomorrow and to all of the questions that Arendt is going to continue to make us ask. Thank you. So I guess uh, Anne has just done what she has sometimes want to do, which is both say and perform mm -hmm. much of what I wanted to talk about better than I possibly could. Um, but that's fine. Um, I do want to add, in addition to all of the thanks that have already been expressed, which I absolutely share, um, my own sort of personal thanks, first to Roger um, for, as a, as a co-editor, being exceedingly indulgent of my, my uh, free obsessions, um, and to all of the contributors, um, the ones who are here, the ones who aren't here. Uh, for their patience with me too, um, and so in this, in some way, the uh, what I want to talk about is a, a response precisely to that. I think that somewhere on the along the road, uh, going back to speaking of undergraduate days, um, when we were supposed to be taught uh, the sort of principle of hermeneutic charity, um, I think what I managed to derive was something more like hermeneutic paranoia. <laughs> um, Ooh, and painful. it's very painful. Mm. Um, and that transferred very readily into my work on this book. Um, <coughs> because I do think that maybe more than any other book, insofar as it's even been turned into a book, um, the Deng Tag book raises to a fever pitch the ethical questions of reading the ethical questions of writing. Um, but not only that, the mere activity of the ethical questions of what we see in a text and what we make of things we see in a text. Um, so if I'm to sort of put my, my hermeneutic tinfoil hat on, um, I did have a worry when we started working on this volume together. And to some extent, that has been played out in ways that I was already feeling uncomfortable with. Uh, I, I mean, my, my instinct was always, if you're feeling comfortable while you're reading the Deng Tagabuk, there's probably something that's missing. Um, but I had, a, I had a very strong discomfort uh, with the idea that much of what was coming out in this Deng Tagabuk as it entered the sphere of political philosophy and political theory and literary theory, because as the sort of concentric circles of Iran studies expand and swallow up, I was reading a neuroscience article recently that mentioned Arendt, um, and I blacked out for an hour. Uh, <laughs> that 
there would be, and in fact there has been, a process of kind of weaponizing the Denk Tagebuch. That in these sort of lovely, rich debates that we have about the nature of judgment, I mean, why is she even saying that these lectures on Kant's political philosophy are lectures on the political philosophy at all, or even about Kant? Um, that the Deng Tagebuch would start being used as a very specific kind of tool, which is, this is what decides. Right. right. This is the decider. Um, and that was scary to me, because for me, that mode of relating to a text like this is, I think, the polar opposite of what she practices and what's going on in the text. Um, and I think for me that all comes to a head in Book 27, which is where I've drawn this quote, um, which is a very good idiosyncratic quote, and involved lots of wild and willful and totally unjustified ellipses. Mm -hmm. um, but th what makes uh, Book 27 interesting um, and I will say, without sort of any compulsion to exaggeration, uh, 40 of the most beautiful pages that I've read in any form of literature. Um, they truly are beautiful. Uh, what makes it, what makes that book extraordinary is that it is both the last full book of the Deng Pond book. It is, it is in some ways where things end. Um, but it ends things in a beautiful way, and that's true in a double sense. On the one hand, even though presumably as she writes it, she has no way of knowing that this is sort of the end of things, the book is utterly preoccupied with ends in the double sense of purposes, purposes of working and thinking and living, and also ends, death. Death is everywhere um, in this book. In one particularly beautiful entry, she <coughs> refers to thinking as a literal and metaphorical preparation for death, um, that we withdraw from the world. And in withdrawing, we, in some sense, mourn it. In another sense, it's beautiful in exactly sort of the sense that Anne was invoking via Kant's third critique of it's very much an embodiment of a Kantian beauty of free play between the imagination and the understanding. And that's true all over the Deng Tagebuch, but it felt in reading it like it came to, sorry to resort to the phrase again, a fever pitch in, in book 27. In the last five entries alone, she writes in all five languages that she speaks fluently. Um, she jumps from thinker to thinker to thinker. In the third to last entry, we have Kant, Aristotle herself, and subordinately, also a little bit of Heidegger. Um, she's just constantly moving back and forth in these gorgeous little fragments that become so much more than what any one of them would be in themselves. Um, and in the midst of that, or really, when I say at the end, since this is the longest, uh, the last sort of full long entry um, in the last full long notebook of the Deng Tagebuch is this curious meditation in which she promises us something um, that she never delivers which is that she strongly suggests, and it's the culmination of a long series of 80-odd entries, that actually she's got something like a replacement for the categorical imperative. Mm -hmm. That this whole Kantian morality thing, uh, it, was, it was all great, except that it started from the wrong premise. And she says in all of two paragraphs, which is about what it takes, um, I have an entire counter theory of morality, aesthetic morality. All you need is rocks. Mm -hmm. right. We don't get anything more. Right. 
we have a sort of central core of what she's working with. We have elliptical references to a dozen other key places in her philosophy, all at the same time. Her either monism or pluralism, her relationship to natality, um, all into something like a morality of judgments and taste. And what I think we end up being left with at the end of not just that entry, um, which picks up on uh, what we were invoking earlier, the crisis of culture, the idea of choosing one's company, um, that it is more the reliance on good instincts, the so-called instincts are probably nothing more than judgments of taste. It's in that sort of set of summations about beautiful morality in some very serious sense, beautiful ethics and the ethics of the beautiful, that I think we also get a kind of consolidation of a way to understand um, what certainly what is going on in this book uh, of the Deng Tagabu, which ends sort of devastatingly with a short note about the death of Heinrich Buche. Mm -hmm. um, this entire long notebook that has been entirely absorbed with ends, ends with her husband's death. We get a vision of morality as a kind of either mournful play or playful mourning, mm -hmm. where thought and the thinking that begins morality is the withdrawal from the world of those pieces which Kant apparently had mistaken for being something like a priori. Their withdrawal from the world <coughs> and setting into play. <coughs> What's crucial for her, clearly, although there's plenty that isn't clear, is that that process of withdrawing things from the world is a mournful process it involves not just a sort of serious reference to the fact that they are phenomenal concepts in the world, but that they carry with them the affective and sort of phenomenal character of their erasure itself. It's one of the reasons why she reinvokes something that she, has, I think, hadn't invoked since the beginning that I talked about, um, which is Plato's dictum that philosophy is either for the young or the very old, which he reiterates here as the young or the dying. <coughs> that it is only in those who can fulfill that process of not only withdrawing things from the world in order to think about them, right, to think about them without losing all of their not just intersubjective but interphenomenal character and setting them into play. It is only the people who are uniquely in that position can do the work of playful mourning that can ethically read the world. So that is what I would suggest is the closest she gives us to what it would mean to read the Deng Tagabu. It's what she would say is reading the world. this give you a little bit of a insight into the richness of Deng Tagaru and, and some of the essays in the book? Um, we have about half an hour, is that right? Um, which is enough time for, I hope, some comments, discussions, questions. They can be in any form. Uh, yeah, I saw Ari and then Kai. All right. Uh, so I guess this is mostly for Roger. I think you say something about this in the, in the chapter. Uh, if you could <coughs> expand here, and but this also relates to I think all of the presentations and chapters as well. Uh, so about the idea of tragedy, uh, uh, which at least from the uh, SARN program on Lessing plays a big role in in reconciliation. So I was just interested in how it, how you'd expand on the on the role of tragedy in, in 
<coughs> conciliation and how that relates to action. Is it kind of a, uh, <coughs> is it a, something that we interpret interpret it into the action or does it spring from the action itself? Kind of question. And of course, in terms of the <coughs> death talkable, this also could relate to her analysis of emotions, which is quite, there are rich uh, entries in the death talkable. Great. Okay. Why don't we take a, that's great. Why don't we take a couple and then we can get them out on the table, okay? Okay, so my question is for Thomas Phil. Um, is there a way of thinking which is not tyrannical? Great question, great point. But it seems to me that there was somebody else who asked a very similar, maybe identical question a few years ahead of Hannah Arendt, and I'm thinking about George Orwell. George Orwell. His question was probably more linguistic. Um, is there a way of using language which doesn't contribute to tyranny? And I'm thinking about his 1946 essay, Politi Politics and English Language, but he preached similar message in various uh, places. And his answer is very different from Arendt's answer, which is interesting. So Arendt's answer, as you said, is plurality of languages. To think in multiple languages can be a way. Right? Whereas Orwell's answer is to use a very plain, down-to-earth English language. So it is, in a way, a commitment to monolingualism. And if you remember um, politics and English language, he wants to get rid of foreign-sounding or foreign-imported jargon, because that is a way of making you stupid. That is an unclear way of thinking and writing. And that, that does not necessarily lead to tyranny, but that could contribute to tyranny. And then he um, cites various people like Harold Lasky, saying, these are the very bad writers of our time. He's very, very harsh. So in the way, what he's suggesting is um, to kind of cleanse foreign elements, as it were, from the English language, because otherwise you might end up in writing and thinking like German metaphysicians. And that is bad. And this is the kind of thing that is going to be taken up by very many Anglophone thinkers who are also responding to the Iranian totalitarianism. But their response, their answer to a very similar question to Arendt's question was very different from Arendt. So the question I want to ask you is that um, the plurality of languages as a response to totalitarianism is by no means obvious as an answer. And then there are lots of other people who thought otherwise. So why did Arendt think that that is the answer? And how plausible was she? Karen, do you want to throw a question out? Sure, thanks. It should be quick. Um, so I'm picking up on Ian's last point about morality as mournful play and about how only those who can kind of um, withdraw things from the world and think about them are capable of, of reading the world mm. on the one hand, and the issue of choosing your company and, or um, uh, you know, choosing to forgive, gi give, judging that someone, that the world is better with someone in it despite their mm -hmm. deeds. I'm wondering about the relationship between that kind of um, moral hermeneutic attitude towards the world on the one hand and the company you would choose on the other, or recognizing persons on the other. Take two more, and then we'll go through <coughs> Tom and uh, Sam. I saw. Um, yeah, I guess my question is also for Ian's um, story about uh, the sort of the morality and the way that it was So it, is, it was about um, looking at uh, as, um, as a basis for morality. Uh, so I would And Sam. Yes, yeah, so my question is for Tomas and about um, listening to both of your papers together um, and the relationship between uh, totalitarian thinking and the quote about logic and, tyr and tyrannical thinking. Sorry. Um, so one question that I kept thinking was, do we make one another lonely? Mm -hmm. um, and so at the end of Origins, Arendt, of course, talks about loneliness in relationship to the concentration camps. But in terms of a practical politics of, of ethical engagement with one another, even in this room right now, um, how we're recognized by the other gives form to that inner plurality in those dialogues that we carry on with ourselves. So what, what consequences do you see um, Arendt's understanding of loneliness in the sense having for both the way we think about the world and the way we recognize one another as thinking beings in the world? Okay. 
Uh, I actually have a question for Anne, so I'll add that in. <laughs> um, which is, in the end of the passage that you took your quote from in on page 571, but August 1957, um, she has a bunch of underlined passages. And the underlined ones are always interesting. <coughs> Tomas's question um, about tyrannical banking is also underlined. You didn't mention that, but it's, it's always important to think about that. And she, she says, um, er kant geht davon aus, dass der Geschmack anderen eben dasselbe wohlgefallen zumutet. Um, which I, in my notes, translated as taste, I mean, or mutet die anderen zu. Uh, they, it encourages the others towards, maybe you can translate, that they come to common sense with all. Right. And that struck me as an incredibly meaningful line when I wrote it. And it's part of this attempt to think about a non-transcendental um, understanding of, of taste and judgment. So I don't know, it was just something, when I, I was reading... it's really a question for Ian. What's well, a question for both of you? Was yeah. from your passage, so I can ask it to both of you, since <laughs> you're both here, you're the con scholars in the room, um, and anyone else who wants to answer it. But it just struck me as a, a really important, not a weaponized thing, but something to think about um, right. in our attempt to understand. All right. Um, so I... You know, Ari asks, I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll try and answer the question. Ari asks, um, tragedy, um, um, you know, Arendt is in my mind and always has been a tragic thinker of sorts, mm -hmm. um, but that only begs the question of what is tragedy. Um, uh, it's a goat song. Uh, <laughs> it's very sexual. It doesn't always think of her in that way. <laughs> um, but there's uh, a way in which it's an that there's a, a, I mean, I think Nietzsche says something along the lines of that it, 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 it makes, you know, what's God awful beautiful, and thus, in a sense, allows us to bear the world. And that is one way of understanding, I think, reconciliation, as Arendt understands it. How do you love the world? And um, that brings us to the question of beauty, taste, aesthetics. <clears throat> And in any discussion of, con of RN's judgment, you have to raise that. And to me, um, part of the brilliance of the last pages of the Eichmann book are as she shifts into this first person judgment, which is for me an <coughs> attempt to create a beautiful judgment of Eichmann saying, I cannot live with you. and. In I cannot, we cannot live with you in a world. Taste zumudit the under and su, right? It, it's an attempt to encourage you to see the world, judge the world the way I judge it. And um, to me, uh, that is very much at the sense of her idea of judgment, which is an aesthetic idea. And it's an attempt to either bring us to my my judgment that we should reconcile or bring us to my judgment that we should not reconcile. And I mean, so like when I think of Tal's paper in Rwanda, right? I mean, when I wrote my first, the first piece I wrote on this was about war trials, right? And I was trying to think, what is Arendt giving us that the typical stuff on, you know, reconciliation from other people or forgiveness or revenge is not? And I think it's something like um, the judgment all of us have to make is whether what we encounter, the evil we encountered, is something we can keep in the world and still see the world as lovable or not. And clearly her answer for Eichmann was no. Interestingly enough, I mean, this is one of the more challenging passages in, in the origins, near the end, where she, I think it's in Ideology and Terror, um, where she says, or maybe earlier, I don't know, where she says that um, if it weren't for totalitarianism, we would never have learned the way evil could appear in the modern world, and it might even have been worse. And I take that to read all the way back to the preface where she says comprehension is the unattentive, is the un unpremeditated attentive facing up to and resisting of reality, whatever it may be. I take those two as bookends 
of her reconciliation with totalitarianism. Not with the Holocaust, but with totalitarianism. With her attempt to say, <coughs> in a way, now that we've gone through it, totalitarianism as we comprehend it and understand it will actually protect us in a certain way, or might. And we can at least reconcile to that. And then the judgment of Eichmann I take to be we can't reconcile to that. So, um, can, can we uh, uh, put a, uh, spend a moment on this, on this term, zumuten? Zumuten. Mm. Because I think it's yeah. not encouraging, actually. Okay. Rufus, do you have a, 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 a specific, yes. it's a very difficult term. It's basically thinking that somebody is capable of something mm. rather than that you're encouraging them to do it. And even putting the weight on someone, right? a certain thought process to somebody, thinking them capable of it, yeah. rather than encouraging them to do it. Zumuten as opposed to ermutigen. So, so it's not giving courage to? No, no. no. Okay. So it's putting the weight on someone to actually engage with that, yeah. right? So it's what gets translated then in Pluhar is the requirement that we require um, agreement from others, agreement to our judgments of taste. Yes, it's, got, it's one of those typical, untrans sort of triple translatable words, but mm. yes, it's definitely not encouraging. Where is she quoting that from? Do you know? Is he quoting that with a with a critique of judgment, <coughs> paragraph fifteen? Yeah. Um, okay. I, That's I, a requirement, rather. Right. Or oh, it has. But what is has it? A, if someone has a. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, like, it's like, so can you not say taste zubut at the under and zoo? Can you not break them up? I mean, honestly, I guess that was my mistake. But zubut is the verb that you're separating. Right, I was saying taste mutet the under and su, and I'm separating zumuten. So I'm wondering if I've made a mistake in thinking I can no, separate. No, it's just them. that zumuten, whether it's together or, or separate, means a slightly different thing. Then ermutigen, you had in, in mind ermutigen, yeah. which is in, 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 encouraging. Yeah. 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 It's, it's to, to put in to put in the onus. Mm -hmm. Because when you might say you're asking too much of me, right? That's mutig mir zu viel zu. Yeah. Like Or that's yeah, right. You're asking You're asking a lot. Asking a lot of me. But what is it? So what does it mean to say that the, the taste zumut in the anderen zu wohlgefallen, right? Thus, the geschmack anderen eben das selbe wohlgefallen zu. It's it's just the structure of the judgment of taste there. Yeah. Imposition. Imposition. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's But it's it's because of, the judgment of taste yeah. looks like an objective. Uh, it, it sounds like a uh, a statement about the object. But rather, it is a statement about the subject that requires the zustimmung of everybody else. Mm -hmm. This is why, isn't it, the Gedenk Tagebuch hasn't been translated. But <laughs> 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 well, this is Kant's fault. This is Kant. Kant. This is, Kant's fault. <laughs> this is Kant. That's why yeah. Kant hasn't been translated. Ah, ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, you want to add? You, you have a question for you, Ken. Um, yes. So uh, I can't respond to your question out of, a, uh, out of the necessary <coughs> familiarity with the Orwell text you're referring to. Uh, what I want to pick up, though, is the point of what kind of language is it that has this capability. I take it from the way you paraphrase uh, uh, Orwell that it's some sort of a common plain language, right? And I think here there is, I would say, a, a, a shared project, that the language of thinking is a, is a language that is, uh, and of judging, is a language uh, that is available to everybody. It's not a language of experts. It's not a language that where you first have to learn, so to speak, a system of, 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 of moral uh, judgment in order to be able to make, the non, uh, to make, a, to make a decision that m might uh, 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 make freedom possible or that is, is non-tyrannical. So and here, I think, for example, she, there is a shared project between her and, and, and Auden. In, mm. in, the, in the late uh, essays on, 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 um, on thinking and moral considerations, that sort of reliance on common language, <coughs> I think, is a, uh, uh, yeah, is a shared project there. Um, 
want to add. add. <laughs> we all want to just add one thing, right? Which is that there's okay. There's there's the English language essay, and then there's 1984. I mean, yeah. the entire premise of the totalitarian language in 1984 is shrinking the vocabulary into 10, 11th, 11th and 10th and 11th dictionaries of Newspeak, right? Mm -hmm. To make it ever more simple and, 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 sh and shrink it down. Mm -hmm. I think the Orwell's issue in the English language is sloppy use of words mm -hmm. and sloppy metaphors. It's not with complexity. I mean, but, he, but it's also, in fact, he it's wants also, complexity. It's also technical. Newspeak is very technical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says it. And that, and Arendt has the same concern in the prologue human condition, right? She says, this is yeah. what's happening. We're getting this jargon, mm -hmm. and we're not able to talk to one another. If we can't talk to one another, then we can't very well be in the world together. So there is no world. Did one of you guys want to respond on that? Real on quick, that? it strikes me as profoundly disappointing to hear Orwell, of all people, uh, <laughs> speak in terms of uh, wanting to purge foreign terminology. I, I'm sympathetic with the notion of minimizing jargon, but the fact that he, coming from you know the heart of the empire, and uh, speaking the English language, which would be nothing like it is were it not for um, gross <laughs> and historical yeah, inter actually. interchange. <coughs> where possible, where possible. So yeah. If you do not need to use foreign imported he doesn't want you to use fancy language for the sake of appearing fancy. I never well, thought it was a little Englander, but, exactly. but that's but, little but that's different. Yeah. But it's, that's really not. Yeah. I, I, I actually don't think his point is to, to simplify. I think it's to make it clear. Yeah, yeah, that's and right, yeah. clarity yeah. comes from laziness yeah. and using people cliches. being pompous and using cliches and things mm -hmm. like that. I think if there's, there's any hint of little Englandism, as you put it, mm -hmm. um, in him, it's what you always see in him, which is that it's actually a sort of very dark, underhanded satire of the people who talk about the English language that way. Right. Like most Orwell things, it's attacking two things, and he's only attacking one openly. Right. While he's spending the rest of the time mocking quietly. The, the well, I, can see, I think you can see the same concern, right? The one that Roger just mentioned from the beginning of the totalitarianism book, which is facing up to reality. How can we? I can't face up to reality on my own. It would, it would be ludicrous for me to do that. If Ian and I both face up to reality in an isolated fashion, then that's <laughs> madness, or that doesn't make any sense. Right. So I think he's also, Orwell's concerned, how can we speak to one another and face up to reality and say what is, which is another time honored tradition. Right? Uh, if we can't say what is uh, in a way that we, understand, that we understand each other, then what's the point? Uh, Val, did you want to respond? Did you you had a Anything. yet the question? But it was a question put to you. That's right, Sam's question. There were other questions. <coughs> or, or, well, or, I'm just a question? Well, just going down the order. order. Oh, okay. Uh, your question about uh, loneliness: Do we make each other lonely? Do mm -hmm. we make one another lonely? That's a very difficult question, uh, and. Um, and I think a different part of your question was whether <coughs> it's required that we feel recognized by others. Is that right? The way we appear in the world, we appear in the world, and we're recognized by others. And that <coughs> engagement with others in the world is what gives form to that two-in-one dialogue. Mark yes. says in the think chapter on thinking. Mm -hmm. So how we're recognized by others, right, helps shape that whether or not we can be thinking and engage in this kind of self-reflective judgment and critical thinking. So, you know, do, do, we, do we, are we actively, do we make one another lonely? Do we make one another tyrannical thinkers? Um, and thinking about a politics of recognition and an ethics of recognition mm -hmm. and the way we engage with one another, yeah. Yeah, I, I find it very difficult to answer that as a kind of, in a kind of general way. Um, yeah. I could, what I, what you could say on the basis of what Aaron says in, in uh, the essay at the, at the end, or the chapter at the very end of Origins of Totalitarianism is <coughs> what happens there is that reality breaks down, common sense breaks down. And as a result of that, the, the inner plurality also breaks down. Mm -hmm. So the, the, primacy, the, pr the, the primacy lies with the, the world of appearances, with the external world. And even in the life of the mind, although it focuses on thinking, that it stays the same. It's that the the external world that 
that we're, yeah, she, she puts the emphasis on. And our inner plurality is somehow, de or seems to be derived from that. And I think you would agree, you, you, you um, that hearing what, what you're saying. Um, and so, but you could say there are several ways to go, but about today, <coughs> about our current age, um, or I, I should say under our current regime, uh, because it's, it's very much a political uh, thing that's going on, is that the, precisely that, 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 that the, the distinction between truth and, and, and uh, uh, falsity, between, uh, between what's, what's true and what's, what's, what's not true, between uh, what's real and what's fake, um, is, is f becomes fuzzy. Uh, and, um, that there, and there are, of course, there are people who, who try to, to deliberately create, create that fuzziness for certain political uh, goals. And, um, and I think, to, to some extent, that what Arendt is talking about in that essay is something like that, that precisely at that moment, in this, this moment of, of, of com confusion, um, uh, people tend to cling to logical reasoning, and not just, um, let's say, citizens, but also certain politicians who do precisely that. I don't need to need, uh, mention that. It ha it's happening in the White House and it's happening outside of the White House. But, um, and and it, that goes for certain um, uh, populist European politicians as well. Um, and, um, and in a situation like that, what, what, is there something we can hold on to in order to uh, retain a, a or yeah, a, a kind of same um, perspective um, um, on the world, um, or a, a, a more or less stable uh, standpoint from which you can enter the world and move in the world and orient yourself, orient yourself in in the world. That's a um, and and the answer to that. If you look at, at thinking, and in the case of Arendt, the, the, the two-in-one, are there ways in, in which you can restore that two-in-one? Uh, it surely helps if you're in an environment where people um, have that in place. Um, um, and, um, but I think it's difficult to, to ask the question where it begins. You cannot, um, it's not entirely causal what's happening there. Um, contingency plays a role. Um, where you can, yeah, a, yeah. A, a comment by Edmund, sure. Uh, very quick. Okay, the very quick. Uh, there's a counterpoint. What happens if the plurality in the two and one actually stops? Jonathan Lear talks about being at the University of Chicago. He's grading papers. He's grading papers for a very long time. He comes to a point of this Kierkegaardian moment of irony where he doesn't know what to do next. The two and one actually stop. Now, when it actually stops, very interesting things happen. I don't think one is lonely so much as now one is with other people in the world. You're riding on the subway in New York City. You may have this ironic moment, but you're still with other people on the subway, sharing the same space, doing the same things, and being contiguous with others as opposed to you know, doing something else. It doesn't have to be a loneliness. It could be a different form of being with. Well, um, thank you. Um, I just, you know, I was just thinking for what, what happens if it actually stops. I don't think the world ends. Quickly. No, no, but, but I think Arendt would, would agree with that. It's I not think she would too. It, it's not that the world ends. Um, and, I, and you can be lonely while you're in company. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's do. certainly a point she makes too. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, just, I didn't mean to cut you off. Anne and Ian, we have a couple minutes left. Do you guys want to respond to any of the things been said, questions, comments? Go ahead, and we'll be thinking while you're talking. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, in a way, uh, both Tal and Karen sort of hedge me into the false promise of my own presentation, uh, which was based on her unfulfilled promise, which was that, yeah, there's, there's clearly something massive here which is a claim that there's some kind of aesthetic morality that fits exactly this question of the choice of who we will live with. And actually I think the 
the dark reverse of that, and she plays with this language in a way that's not always obvious, is that in the section on Eichmann, in her judgment on Eichmann, that language is reversed. We will not yeah. share the world with you. With you. Um, and all I would say is that she gives two strong hints. It's not even remotely all I could say, but I suspect that's why my students have left the room. Um, I would just say that she gives us two huge hints on this that are beautiful to me because I can't subsume them in my categories of understanding, so they set my mind to free play. One of which is that at the end of the entry I quote, she says, Kant's greatest mistake was to forget his greatest hint. And his greatest hint that he had was that people would not want the bad things that they do to appear. Right. And that if he had taken that as the beginning, that what is wrong is that which we have the instinct, she says, an instinct is basically judgment, to not want to appear, that would have prevented <coughs> the solipsism of the categorical imperative. Um, and in turn, the other moment which gets to this question of choosing with whom we want to be is this really striking moment that I've never known quite what to make with. It's right next to an extended discussion of the one of wonder. Wonder is the beginning of thinking, and yet next to that, she has this entry that reads, everything that, that, everything that is appears. Everything that appears disappears. Everything that is alive has an urge to appear. This urge is called vanity. Since there is no urge to disappear, and disappearance is the law of appearance, the urge, called vanity, is in vain. <coughs> vanitas, vanitatum, vanitas. All is vanity, all is in vain. So I think going on behind that, as bleak as that sounds, like I said, remember, this is a very mournful book, but I think it's trying to resurrect a sort of, but a positive aspect of mourning, right? Which is that behind that discussion where she says there is no urge to disappear, and since disappearance is the law of appearance, the urge of vanity is in vain, is that in a sense, in seeking to be with others, remember that the act of thinking is pulling out of something. And in pulling out of that, let's, let's call it our little symposium, right? In pulling out of a symposium, we're choosing to mourn that act, right? As we disappear into our world of thinking, we are choosing, in a, se in a sense, when we choose that to which we are appearing, <coughs> we're also choosing that which we will mourn in thinking. And so when we say with a rent, I would rather be wrong with Plato than that, um, we are saying, I would rather mourn in my disappearance from the people I choose to love than to mourn in my disappearance from those I would not. Is it morning, morning, thinking, appearance? morning, thinking, morning. Morning in your disappearance with Plato or appearance with Plato as your friend? Both. So this is what leads her out of the third critique, but not into Romanticism. So the. I think she thinks. Yeah. You think she thinks? I think she what thinks. Do, what do you think? <laughs> no, I I, I, just I, I, I agree. Um, I, wonder, is there, I just is, think that other people. Will Right, because the morning can go either way, right? Right. So it can be, uh, it can be the subconscious morning and the, the self distance that's built into morning, yeah. or it can be the, be the beautiful death. Right. But it's important that the next entry after that, after this very thing, about, heavy thing about vanity, is this long thing about if wonder is the beginning of thinking, then think the, th the thinker is always the spectator. And she begins with what we would expect from having heard the lectures on Kant's political philosophy and read all the various commentaries that, oh, this is the thing she thinks is great. Judge, impartial, uh, spectator, great. Except the entry ends, I now judge as though I had no part. This impartiality, not being a part of it, is perhaps inhuman. 